Forum, White Lies, The Truth About Segregation in America is sponsored by the United Way of Central Ohio, thank you, the Dispatch Media Group, and in partnership with the Ohio Civil Rights Commission. Won't you please help me thank them for their support? Now please help me welcome Angel Harris, Senior Vice President of Resource Development at the United Way of Central Ohio to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you, Columbus Metropolitan Club, for hosting this important conversation today. So there's a belief that exists that it doesn't matter if you grew up rich or poor, in a good neighborhood or a tough one, that if you worked hard, did well in school, and set your sights high, that eventually you would succeed and that we all have equal opportunity. Well, it turns out that those ideas are wrong. Everyone does not have the same opportunity. And the theory of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps simply doesn't work if you don't have boots in the first place. So the driving force that keeps me going every day at United Way is knowing that together we give boots to the bootless and we give a hand up, not a hand out. Together, we help those that have the greatest needs in our community. We help them restore stability in their lives. We help them live productive lives. And we help them contribute their talent to our society. At the same time, we help the working poor find strategies to get ahead. Some think that the poor are poor because they don't try hard enough. And I can say from seeing the work that I do every day that some have been dealt a hand that some of us could not begin to even play, let alone win. And for many, especially people of color, the deck is already stacked against them. Today, we get to explore the how and the why. Please welcome today critically acclaimed author of The Color Law, Richard Rothstein, former OSU and NBA basketball star and the author of Socio-Psychonomics, Lawrence Funderburg, former Michigan State Court Judge and Federal Prosecutor, Administrative Law Judge, Noceba Southern, and journalist at the Columbus Dispatch, Tim Farron. Richard will start, our, start us off with some opening comments and Tim Farron will lead us through the conversation. Mr. Rothstein, the podium is yours. Thank you very much, and thanks to all of you and to the Columbus Metropolitan Club for inviting me here today to share some of these ideas with you. As you all know, in the mid-20th century, this country decided to abolish racial segregation. We decided that it was wrong, that it was harmful, uh, that it was immoral, and that it was unconstitutional. And beginning in the 1930s, we abolished segregation first in law schools and then in graduate schools and then in uh, colleges. In 1954, as you all know, we abolished segregation in elementary and secondary schools. In the 1960s, we abolished segregation in everything from water fountains to buses to uh, public accommodations of all kinds to employment. And yet, having done all this, and having convinced ourselves that racial segregation was wrong and harmful and immoral and unconstitutional, we've left untouched the biggest segregation of all. And that is that every metropolitan area in this country is residentially segregated by race. I've lived in many of them, they're all racially segregated. How is it that while we've decided that racial segregation is incompatible with our constitution, with American democracy, that it causes so many of the social problems we have today, that we've left untouched the biggest segregation of all, uh, even while we pride ourselves as, as having become a desegregated society. And I think the reason is, is not hard to understand. Residential segregation is much more difficult to undo than the other segregations that I just mentioned. If we abolish segregation in buses or in water fountains or in lunch counters, 
Uh, the next day, you can sit anywhere you want on the bus or drink from any water fountain or eat at any restaurant. But if we abolish segregation in the residential neighborhoods, the next day things wouldn't be much different. It's a harder thing to undo. And so we've developed a national myth, a rationalization, to justify to ourselves the fact that we've tolerated a form of racial segregation that determines the, the violence in our communities, that determines the big achievement gap in schools, that creates an enormous gap in incomes. We've tolerated it because we say it didn't really happen by public policy. It's not the kind of segregation that we abolished everywhere else. We call it de facto segregation. It's a term we're all familiar with. We've got de facto segregation in our neighborhoods. De facto segregation means it was created by um, individual choices. People like to live with others of the same race, or maybe there were private uh, real estate agents or home sellers who discriminated against African-American buyers, or maybe low-income families that don't have enough money to move into middle-class neighborhoods. All of these informal, accidental events that created segregated neighborhoods. And we say to ourselves, and the Supreme Court has endorsed this, if it happened by accident, it has to be undone by accident. Only, the Supreme Court has said, and we've all adopted this rationalization as well, if it was created by public policy, by government, by law, by regulation, only if it was done by law and regulation can we undo it, and not only if it was created by law and regulation, we're obligated to undo it. Well, the reality is that de facto segregation is a myth. The residential segregation of every metropolitan area in this country was created by explicit government policy, racially designed to separate the living spaces of whites and blacks. It's as unconstitutional as water fountain segregation and any of the other segregations that um, I've mentioned. But we've not dealt with it. We've not addressed it. We do nothing to, to uh, try to undo it. Uh, we live with it. And it's a blemish on our, our national character. It's a contradiction. Uh, with our constitutional obligations uh, and our principles of democracy. Well, in a few minutes uh, th this morning or this afternoon, or well, I guess this afternoon, uh, in a few minutes this afternoon, let me describe to you some of the major policies, and I can't go into all of them, but there were so many public policies, federal, state, and local, that explicitly created residential segregation, uh, policies that were so powerful that they determine our racial boundaries today. The first one I'll mention is public housing. Now, I know you all think of public housing as, as a place where poor people live, uh, single mothers with children, or young men without hope, uh, violence, uh, drug dealing. That's not how public housing began in this country. Public housing began in this country during the Depression as a New Deal program for working families. It wasn't subsidized. It was people who had jobs. If they didn't have jobs, they weren't eligible. People who had jobs, but because there was no housing available in the Depression, the government built housing for them. And it built it everywhere on a segregated basis, frequently creating segregation in communities that hadn't previously known it. Uh, that may surprise you, but in the mid and, and early 20th century, many metropolitan areas were integrated. They were integrated for the simple reason that workers didn't have automobiles to get to work. And so if you had an industrial area where African Americans and immigrants from Europe and uh, rural migrants were all working in the same industrial facilities. They had to live close enough to be able to walk to work. So you had integrated neighborhoods. The great African-American um, novelist, playwright, poet Langston Hughes describes in his autobiography how he grew up in an integrated Cleveland neighborhood. We don't think of downtown Cleveland as being an integrated place. He said his best friend was Polish when he went to high school. He dated a Jewish girl. This was an integrated Cleveland neighborhood, the central neighborhood of Cleveland. The Public Works Administration, one of the first New Deal agencies, demolished integrated housing there and built two separate projects, one for whites, one for African Americans. This was not the South. This was Cleveland, uh, creating a pattern of segregation that helped determine the development of Cleveland's residential boundaries to this present day. And this was done all over the country. In my book, The Color of Law, I like to speak about liberal places, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, because I figure that if I can explain that this happened in places like that, you might understand that it happened everywhere. The area around MIT, the Central Square neighborhood in the 1930s, was an integrated neighborhood, about half black and half white. The Public Works Administration demolished housing in that neighborhood, integrated housing, and built two separate projects, 
one for whites and one for blacks, creating a pattern of segregation in the Boston metropolitan area that persists to this day. During World War II, uh, this continued. Uh, hundreds of thousands of workers flocked to centers of defense production uh, to take jobs that hadn't been available in the Depression. The populations of, of places where there were defense facilities uh, exploded. And if uh, the government wanted the tanks and the jeeps and the airplanes and the ships to keep on being produced, it had to find housing for this massive influx of workers, both white and black, to, um, uh, to uh, centers of defense production. And so it did. It built segregated housing everywhere for uh, workers um, coming to defense facilities, frequently in places that had never had African Americans living there before. So there was no previous segregated pattern that the government was preserving. This was a government creation of, of segregation. In my book, I like to talk about a place like um, Richmond, California, a suburb of Berkeley, another liberal place. It was a white community, all white community before World War II. The Kaiser shipyards were built to turn out ships um, uh, for the war effort. Uh, there were no shipyards before the war. By the end of the war, there were 100,000 workers working in the Kaiser shipyards in the community that had a population of 20,000, all white, uh, prior to uh, the war. The government had to build housing for these workers. It built housing for the African-American migrant workers along the railroad tracks uh, in the industrial era uh, 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 and close to the shipyards. Uh, shoddy housing, temporary housing, and it built housing for the white workers, more stable housing in the residential areas of Richmond that were previously all white and were, remained all white. The government of Richmond, the city government of Richmond, explained that it had asked the federal government to do it in this way because any African Americans who moved to Richmond would have to leave at the end of the war, so they didn't need permanent housing. This again happened all over the country. Segregated housing built for war workers coming to uh, centers of defense production and creating patterns of segregation in cities like the San Francisco Bay Area that never previously had segregation and never otherwise would have had it. Uh, after the war, after World War II, millions of returning war veterans uh, returned to the country and there was a big housing shortage. So President Truman, uh, who was the president after World War II, proposed a massive expansion of the National Public Housing Program. And remember, we're not talking about poor people. These were working people, returning war veterans who had jobs, but there was no housing available because there's no housing had been built uh, except for war workers for the last 20 years. So President Truman proposed the National Housing Act, and conservatives in Congress wanted to defeat it, not for racial reasons, because it was all segregated, not because they didn't like poor people, because it was all for working families. Uh, they wanted to defeat it because they thought that housing, public housing, was socialistic and the private market should take care of it. The leader of this effort was your own senator, Robert Taft, uh, here of Ohio, and he proposed a poison pill amendment to try to defeat the National Housing Act that President Truman had proposed to create a massive amount of housing for returning war veterans. And the poison pill strategy he adopted was he proposed an amendment, and he had colleagues in the House who proposed it also, that from now on, all public housing had to be integrated. No more segregation in public housing. No more discrimination in public housing. This was Robert Taft's amendment. And um, his theory was, his strategy was, that the conservatives in Congress would vote for this amendment. They would be joined by northern liberal Democrats. The amendment would pass. And then when the full bill came up before Congress with this integration amendment, the conservatives would flip and vote against the final bill. They would be joined by southern Democrats who were opposed to integrated housing, although quite happy to have integrated, uh, segregated public housing, and the bill would go down to defeat. So northern liberals, led by Senator Hubert Humphrey, uh, Senator Paul Douglas, uh, two Midwestern liberal senators, campaigned against the integration amendment. They succeeded in getting northern liberals to vote against integration in public housing. The amendment went down to defeat. The full housing bill came up before the House and Senate. It was now passed because the Southern Democrats voted for it, along with the Northern Liberals. And the 1949 Housing Act, which to me is not so long ago, was adopted as an ongoing segregated program. And the federal government used this vote, this defeat of the integration amendment, as its justification for continuing to segregate all federal housing programs with a public housing or other programs for the next 15 years, up until the mid-1960s. Well, very soon after the giant projects from this 1949 Housing Act were built, 
a development occurred all across the country. The giant projects, you're familiar with many of them, uh, uh, Pruitt Igo in St. Louis or Robert Taylor Homes in Chicago. A development occurred all over the country. And remember, again, we're talking about working families paying the full cost of their rent and housing. A development occurred that large numbers of vacancies occurred in the white projects and long waiting lists in the black projects. Eventually, the situation became so conspicuous that all the projects were opened up to African Americans. At about the same time, industry left the cities because industry no longer needed to be uh, near deep water ports or near railroad terminals. We had highways that could transport both uh, materials and finished products from the factories, so the factories moved out to the suburbs. Jobs disappeared in the central cities. The people living in public housing, who are now predominantly African American, uh, uh, no longer had many access to good jobs. They became poorer and poorer. Public housing came to be subsidized for the first time uh, so that the cost of the housing wasn't paid for in the, in the rent of the uh, residents, and we got the kind of vertical slums uh, that uh, public housing came to be known as. But that's not how public housing began. Well, the question you should ask yourself, and I asked myself when I was doing this research, is how did all these vacancies occur in the white projects and long waiting lists in the black projects? And this was because of another very powerful federal program of the Federal Housing Administration that was designed to suburbanize the entire white population into single family homes. This was an explicit racial policy of the federal government. It's not the, the benign, policy, benign program that whites happened to take advantage of and African Americans didn't. This was an explicit program of the federal government to suburbanize the white population to get whites out of central cities into single family homes in the suburbs. The most famous of these, and they happened all over the country, I apologize, I, I, I can't study every city in the country, so I don't know specific names of developments here in the Columbus area, but I know there were some because this was everywhere. The most famous of these was Levittown, east of New York City. 17,000 homes. Where was Levitt going to get the capital to build 17,000 homes for which he had no buyers? The only way he could get the capital to buy the land for that development and to construct 17,000 homes was by going to the Federal Housing Administration, submitting his plans for the development, getting the Federal Housing Administration's <laughs> approval for these plans, and with this approval, he could go to banks and get a loan guaranteed by the federal government to buy the land and build the development. In order to get that Federal Housing Administration guarantee, he had to make a commitment never to sell a home to an African American, and to include a clause in the deed of every home in this development that prohibited resale to African Americans. This was an explicit federal requirement. The Federal Housing Administration had an underwriting manual distributed to all appraisers in the country whose responsibility it was to evaluate these proposals for developments uh, for eligibility for federal guarantees. The underwriting manual said that no approval could be given to a development that didn't have a single racial class it also said no development could be um, approved if it was near an African-American neighborhood and ran the risk of, quote, infiltration by incompatible racial elements. This was federal policy. This was not de facto segregation. These homes were very inexpensive. They were 750 square feet. They cost, in those days, $9,000 a piece, roughly $100,000 in today's money, twice national median income. Any Working African-American or white family could afford to buy a home like that with an FHA or VA mortgage. Whites were subsidized to buy it. African-Americans prohibited, prohibited by federal policy from moving to these suburbs. What's the result? The result today is that those homes that sold for $100,000 in today's money uh, in the mid-20th century, in places like Levittown, you know these suburbs all across the country. Some of you may remember a song that Pete Seeger used to sing about the little boxes on a hillside made of ticky-tacky and they all look the same. That was a suburb south of San Francisco. Those homes sold for $100,000. Today, they sell for $400,000, $500,000. White families who bought those homes gained over the next couple of generations $200,000, $300,000, $500,000 in wealth, in equity. African Americans who were prohibited by explicit federal policy from moving into single family homes in these suburbs created everywhere in the country continued to rent either in public housing or um, in, in the private market um, and gain none of that equity. The subsidy for whites was so great that they could move out of the public housing projects 
where, uh, and into these single family homes in the suburbs and pay less in their monthly housing charges with a VA or FHA mortgage than they were paying in rent in public housing. Well, today we have um, uh, uh, an income gap between African Americans and whites, about 60%. African American incomes, on average, have about 60% of white incomes. African American wealth is 10% of white wealth. And that enormous disparity between a 60% income ratio and a 10% wealth ratio is entirely attributable to unconstitutional federal housing policy that we have never remedied and that we've avoided remedying by adopting a myth that this never happened, that this was only an accident, that African Americans just chose not to move to suburbs or couldn't afford to, or, or so forth. Unless we relearn this history, and it's not a, it's not a hidden history, it was out in the open, everybody knew that this was going on uh, 50 years ago, we've forgotten it. Unless we can relearn this history, we will not be able to contemplate the kinds of conversations we need in this country to remedy, uh, to undo uh, these policies of explicit segregation that the government followed. We'll need federal policies that are as aggressive to desegregate as they were to segregate. But without a national consensus that we're dealing with the same kind of unconstitutional, the jury segregation in housing that we were dealing with in schools or in buses or in restaurants or on water fountains, we're not going to be able to begin to have those conversations. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'd be glad. I guess we're going to have questions and discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I originally am from Cleveland. I don't, I'm not old enough to remember when Langston Hughes grew up there, but I am old enough to remember redlining, blockbusting, uh, and when the Fair Housing Act passed. Uh, and so it was startling to me to read in the book that uh, that's not being taught in schools and that there's a certain amount of um, amnesia in this country about those things. So I'd like to ask our panelists, uh, Nosiba, Lawrence, about your personal experiences with these things. Well, first, thank you for having me here. I'm absolutely delighted to be a participant on this panel on a very important subject matter. Um, and having had experiences in serving in public service for a number of years, Prior to that, I was another young black female living in the city of Detroit. And I can recall specifically, pointedly to your question, um, a time when I was a young female looking to purchase a new home, moving from the city of Detroit, working downtown at the U.S. Attorney's Office, doing what I thought was what you were supposed to do in terms of becoming a professional and making an impact and having a difference and looking for a home in Gross Point. Now, if you're familiar with Detroit, Detroit abuts Gross Point, which is a predominantly white neighborhood. It goes from Gross Point, Gross Point Farms, well, Gross, Gross Point Shores. Uh, and so the closer to Detroit, of course, is less expensive. The closer to Detroit, of course, is more diverse to the extent that it is diverse. Well, I was looking for a place there, and I had, I forgot, I neglected to mention this, I was a realtor too. So I was working at the U.S. Attorney's Office, but also had my real estate license. So I made an appointment to go see a home in Gross Point, mm -hmm. talk to the realtor, made the appointment with the owner, we're going to meet them there, got there. The cars were in the driveway. I pulled up to the curb to park my car, went up to the house. They would not answer the door. I knocked. No one would answer the door. I called the realtor. No one would answer the door. So that was a, a very hard pill to swallow because here I am thinking that, hey, I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to do. I'm not causing trouble, I'm not committing crimes, I have a law degree, I'm actually doing public service for the federal government and I can't get a place in a community that I think I wanna live in. And so for me, when this opportunity came, it really, it brought back a lot of those memories. It brought back the time of serving 
as, U, uh, as assistant U.S. attorney doing mortgage fraud and seeing how some of these underwriting practices where there's a disparity in the fees that are, that are attributed to minorities in seeking loans because of their, the down payment that they are or are not able to put down or their credit score. Well, we know that housing and credit is the backbone of this economy and minorities, African Americans, blacks, whatever you want to call us, have historically had very little of it. And so this to me was a welcome opportunity to be able to sit next to Mr. Ronstein, who has put together such a masterful piece of work, in my opinion, is something that we all need to take note of. Lawrence, you had some good comments at lunch. Uh, tell us about your experiences. Yeah, you know, um, getting this book, uh, and I know Boyce Safford gave me a copy of this book. Thank you, Boyce. And, uh, We've kind of gone through an identity metamorphosis, and uh, just reading that, that was, this book has been tough because I grew up in public housing, I grew up on welfare, uh, I keep a food stamp in my pocket, I still have the slip, the receipt when we, uh, uh, for CMHA, Columbus Metropolitan Housing Authority, we paid $60 a month, it was five of us in the house, that's what we paid. I lived in public housing for 18 years. And one of the things that I read here was really tough is the identity metamorphosis. We were first called Negroes, then we were colors, then we were African Americans, and now we're blacks. And uh, it's tough when you're poor, and you come from a single parent household, and you grow up in this environment. And you said something about amnesia. And I'll just tell you a story. It's not just economics, but also education. I uh, went to school at uh, Westgate Elementary in the early 80s, and I remember a teacher there. I would call him Mr. G. He might still be living, so I don't want to say his name. But, you know, Mr. G, you know, he, he had this chart in his room, and to give you a context of the subtleties of, of how things are ingrained in you at an early age to condition you to fall into the prophecy that's been said. You're from a poor environment, so what good is your life really? And I remember Mr. G, has, he has this chart up, it's a behavior chart, and you're rewarded or punished based on your behavior. To the right of that behavior, uh, of his chart was good, better, and best, and you would put in there. And then to the left was on the way, almost there, in jail. And then with jail, hold on, with jail, there was white lettering, and the backdrop was black. And I'm not sure how he was able to get away with this in the early 1980s, and he would have came of age in the 1950s and the 1960s. He was in his 50s approximately then, and he would annoy uh, the hell out of us because he had this putrid cologne, and. Um, you know, and he, you know, did these things, and, and I, I got, I got to, to better one time, but it was always something that we did or something that he thought we did to pull us back down, and he would reward us or reward those who had favorable behavior by giving them extra recesses or snacks or something like that, and when we, when the, we, I was never able to go outside a whole lot, but uh, I would see my classmates outside, and he would always stare at us those inside, we were all African Americans, just to say, I'm keeping my eye on you. And sometimes when we had other behavior issues, so supposedly he would stick us in the back or he would make us stand in the corner and he would make us put our hands up to say, let's just get you ready for that because that's exactly what your prophecy is gonna be. And the thing that's amazing is I'm a Christian, I love the Lord and I hold no ill will toward him. I think it's very important that when we're talking about the past that we don't really get, relitigate the past and make people feel guilty and bad about it. So I'm, I'm totally against that. But I don't know how he was able to get away with this because there were teachers, there were administrators, nobody called and complained to the Ohio Department of Education, nobody complained to the Columbus City Schools. And here was a guy who was able to do this. And my point is, when you stand by and do nothing, you're as complicit as those who are guilty of causing the problems in the first place. Now, of course, when laws are passed, they take on an inertia. They become embedded, and that's how things go, of course. And, and, and so affecting the social amnesia, I was kind of startled to, to remember that in 2007, Chief Justice John Roberts concluded that discrimination is not traceable to government's own action and therefore required no constitutional remedy. Richard, what the heck is going on there? 
as I said, we have denied this history. It's our rationalization for not dealing with a very difficult problem because, as I said, this, these policies created a wealth gap which determines a lot of the inequality in this country today. That's going to be a very difficult thing to remedy. And so we have a rationalization. It's not unusual in human behavior to rationalize something with a, a, a false theory. And um, the, the Justice Roberts does not know the history or at least wants to ignore it. You know, you mentioned that none of us were taught this. In the course of writing this book, I, I looked at the high school textbooks that are used in every high school and middle school in this country. They all lie about it. I, I, I'm sorry to use that word, but it's true. it's true. The most popular American history textbook in this country today, the most widely used one, is called The Americans. It's 1,200 pages. It's got one paragraph, um, uh, the subhead is in, about the discrimination in the North, one sentence about housing, and the sentence reads as follows. In the North, African Americans found themselves forced into segregated housing. So passive yes. voice, yes, no yes. blame aside. That's right. Uh, you know, African Americans woke up one day, they looked out the window, and they said, hey, you know, we're in segregated <laughs> well, housing. I'm magic. Well, yes. you know, if the, th this is a serious problem, because if the next generation is mistaught this history in the same way that we've been mistaught it, they are going to be in as poor a position to remedy it as we've been. And so I urge all of you, I, everywhere I speak, I say, you know, this is something that everyone can do now. You all live in school districts. You all have access to principals and school board members and superintendents and teachers. And we can begin to address how this is being taught in schools so that we can begin to set a foundation, at least for the next generation, to address it. And I guarantee you that if uh, you start a conversation about how it's being taught in schools, you'll start a conversation about with the adults in the community as well. Uh, you mentioned in the book that to remedy this situation, costs will be involved. Yes, yeah, some costs. Who pays? How, who, pay, who will pay? Well, um, we, every social policy has costs, and, and the taxpayers will pay them. But well, there are many things we can do that won't cost anything to reverse this. Uh, Judge Southern and I were talking about uh, this over lunch. We have two programs uh, for low-income families that presently reinforce segregation that we could remedy if there was a political will to do so uh, with no cost at all. One is the Section 8 housing voucher program, which provides a subsidy to low-income families to rent apartments. Uh, that program reinforces segregation because landlords in middle-class communities won't accept the vouchers. The vouchers are structured in such a way that they're usable only in already segregated communities. The other program is the low-income housing tax credit program, a, a, a subsidy for developers uh, of low-income housing. And that program is also structured so that it's used primarily to build low-income housing in already low-income communities rather than in middle-class communities where the families living in that housing would have opportunities for jobs and good education. That would be very easy to, to remedy as well, to place a priority on the placement of those projects in high opportunity communities. Those, wouldn't co that, those two reforms wouldn't cost anything at all. All they would cost is political will. Now, of course, we could embark on much more expensive programs as well. Um, you know, I, I've, uh, the example I gave before, if we really wanted a constitutional remedy for the exclusion of African Americans from these suburbs, uh, the federal government could uh, say Levittown, the example I use, where homes now sell for $500,000. Federal government could buy up some of those homes at the $500,000 market rate and resell it to qualified African Americans for $100,000 to remedy the inequality that was created. That would be a very nar narrowly targeted remedy for a specific constitutional violation. And there is no lawyer in this room or anywhere else who would say that, who would, could say that that's not a narrowly targeted legitimate remedy, but we're not prepared to do that with the, without the political will. That would be expensive, but there are many things we can do short of that. We're going to move to audience questions in just a few minutes, so uh, don't be shy. Please step up to the microphone. But first, let me ask um, Lawrence, Judge, uh, do you feel you're doing as much as, as you could, as you should be doing? to help remedy the situation. And I'm also wondering, just uh, at a personal level, do you live in a integrated neighborhood or is it predominantly one race? Yeah, I, that's a great question. I think uh, uh, there is, uh, you know, 
there's black America privilege as well, and I, I've benefited from black athlete privilege because uh, oftentimes black athletes are treated even more better than, than whites because we have a revered position in society. And I think in our community, we've talked about this, about that, uh, you know, I don't, I'm well removed from the gangs and the drugs and the crime and all of the stuff. And, and, and really, as an African American, I mean, we don't really have to deal with a lot of the issues that the typical and particularly inner city African American has to go through on a daily basis. So well, we're, we're certainly removed from that. And I think one of the things I challenge folks, particularly in my book, is we have to, to really think about what our legacy is going to be. And I tell folks all the time, it's not just about the people who are connected to you biologically, but you have an obligation to help those who have no biological connection to you. And whenever I'm in front of an audience like this, I want to challenge folks to do more. You can do more, not to sit by and this hope that someone else is going to deal with this problem or pass it on to the next generation. This is your responsibility. We have to do more. And whenever I go, I'm imploring people to do more because we just cannot sit by. And I think open your homes up. Mentor. Don't just give money. Get your hands dirty. You know, I tell folks all the time, don't just give money. Get your hands dirty. And I think when you really, and I think the big thing is we can give people better housing, but if you never change someone's mindset and mentality, you don't really help them. So we're trying to modify behaviors when we haven't changed the mindset. In order to change a mindset, you have to change your frame of reference or how you filter information. And that's the key, right? You can't just put someone in better housing. You have to actually help improve their life. And one way that you do that is by really getting them to understand that wealth is multifaceted. It's much just bigger than financial wealth. There are all kinds of wealth, and it starts intangibly first. So we've got to really do that. And it really is incumbent upon every one of us who are sitting in this room today. No, Steve. Yeah, and I just want to piggyback on um, something that Lauren said when he spoke about how we have to take responsibility for it and, and our, our thinking. And so part of what we're doing, and I think is important, is having this conversation. Um, I, and I think one of the things that you'll have that comes from that is that you'll have folks who may think, like Angela mentioned in our opening, you know, this is something that you should take personal responsibility for. You are where you are because you don't work hard enough, you don't have drive you're lazy, whatever. Then there's the other side that says, well, no, it's been a lack of opportunity. These opportunities have been, been denied me, and so I have not been able to move forward because you have systematically and strategically kept me from doing so. But I think at the end of the day, what you have to realize is that black individuals did not choose to live in substandard conditions. We did not choose to be in a place where we could not have what everyone else have or do and be what everyone else is doing and being. So it comes a point where you learn how to survive because you're being precluded from thriving. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think if you just take a, a minute and you go back to prior to um, the Jim Crow laws and the New Deal, black folks were doing pretty well. We were integrating into society. We were business owners. We were congressmen. We were, we were senators. We were uh, lawyers, doctors, bankers. We had, and we were integrating. But after that, when you get to the place where you have just been subjected to, you cannot have but everyone else can have, and this piece of paper says that I'm going to keep you from having it, and I can legally do so, then you're left in a position where you're, you're struggling. You're in, and then when you go from, for example, the King Lincoln, Lincoln District once was the hub of this community in Columbus for, them, for black individuals. Well, they built a highway right through theirs, I-71. The same thing happened in Detroit. The hub there was Black Bottom in Paradise Valley. They built 375 right through there. So even when African Americans were thriving, it was taken away. It was taken away. So the whole notion about, you know, whether or not the place where you are and, and the conditions that you live in is it, supposed to be that way, and it's, be, it's not because of a lack of trying. It's, be, it's been because of a denial. We've been, we've been denied those opportunities, and so we have to do more to change that. And so I think it's a fallacy that belies reality if you don't ask the question, is where black Americans are a result of, uh, is it because of, you know, the, you know, they don't want this, or is it a consequence of these racial in inequalities? And I think it's a consequence of these racial inequalities, not because of, uh, of 
racial, be, excuse me, it's, it's a consequence of racial inequalities. So with that, I just think that we have to do more in order to change the dynamics in our community and externally as well. So. It's the CMC's tradition to take audience questions. So it is now time to please state your name, ask your question, and in consideration to everyone, please phrase your questions in the form of questions rather than as editorial comments. <laughs> The first question, please. My name is Janice James. I'm a general pediatrician here in the community. And for Mr. Rothstein, um, in writing this book and talking about this issue where you marginalized, was there a price you had to pay? And if so, yes, were you financially protected by speaking out? Uh, and I ask that because so many African Americans, when we begin to speak out, you know, we get marginalized, you lose your jobs, on and on and on. Um, and what do you think about reparations? And then for, um, <laughs> had to ask it, ah, for, Mr. And for Mr. Funder, uh, Burke, just, you may or may not be aware, um, and you can check the data, because I haven't looked at all of it, but Ohio State, my understanding is, I don't know whether it was the 2017 freshman class or which class, but out of about 5,000 males, only 100 were admitted in one of the last classes. And I would love for some of our graduates of OSU that are in the NBA and the football player all to really look into that. That is just disgraceful. And I don't know what, what percent of that 100 are athletes. Well, there was a lot there, but the, let me say, I'll just address, to leave some time for some other questions, I'll address the reparations issue. There are many policies that we should follow if we understood this history and understood our obligations as American citizens to remedy it. Some of them would cost money. Others would not cost anything at all. Uh, one of the biggest problems we have, for example, is uh, the um, zoning ordinances in, in middle-class suburbs that preserve their all-white character by prohibiting the construction of uh, townhouses or uh, apartments or even single family homes on small lot sizers. Prohibiting those kinds of zoning ordinances costs nothing. Uh, we don't, uh, reparations implies the, a, a, a transfer of money. Certainly some of the programs would cost money, but I think reparations is too narrow a concept. We need policies on an ongoing basis to remedy the uh, segregation that we, our country, has created. Yeah, it, you know, I'm against reparations. I, I think uh, uh, I, I think anytime you, you you really hold people hostage to the past who had nothing to do with the pain of the past, I think it can be a very dangerous thing. And I think uh, I, I I love this country. Uh, I don't have any animosity toward this country, in spite of growing up in a very impoverished background. Um, when it comes to Ohio State, uh, my wife and I we created a fund to help more African Americans go to Ohio State. Uh, you got to get a 28 on ACT as well. So. Uh, you got to have your, your grades together, and uh, I think one of the things is, is we've got to invest more in our African Americans as opposed to just looking at them as specimens on the football field or the basketball court. When are we going to really value what they bring to the table from the neck up? And for me, I've always had an issue, and I think I've never been a, a fall-in-line Negro. I've always spoken my mind. I've never been ashamed of that. And I think it's, it's time for, for our athletes, and particularly our universities, to do more to empower our, our athletes. I'm against paying uh, athletes. That's a whole nother issue because I think once you start paying them, you start handicapping them. So I think you've got to really think about how can we impact and empower African Americans to really change their legacy uh, footprint. I think that's really what it's about. So I will look into that issue to see what's going on because I know it's a huge issue getting uh, African Americans to not only uh, go to Ohio State but to graduate as well. Yes. Thank you. And the next question. Thank you very much for such a great presentation. And thank you for talking about inclusionary zoning. I mean, that's the, what we need to do to deal with the uh, restrictive zoning we have today. Um, you mentioned the um, Section 8. And only 25% of people who are eligible for Section 8 housing assistance get it. I, oh, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Amy Clavin. I am uh, principal of strategic opportunities and facilitating a project called Move to Prosper. 
it seems to me one thing we need to do is require or encourage landlords in suburban areas and the high opportunity areas to open up their doors and become less segregated. Um, we can't build enough. Do you have any thoughts on how we can require or enable um, mixed income communities throughout our region? I do uh, have thoughts about it. And in fact, they're not my thoughts originally. There are places that are beginning to do some of this. It requires political will. The problem is not lack of concept. The problem is the political will to do it. You're absolutely right. The, you know, we have, the biggest housing program in this country that we have is an entitlement. It's uh, called a mortgage interest deduction. And it subsidizes the housing of primarily white homeowners uh, throughout the country. And anybody who has a mortgage can deduct it. There's not, the government doesn't appropriate a certain amount of money and when it's all used up it says, well, you know, the first 25% of the people who want to um, uh, deduct their mortgage interest will get it and the rest you're out of luck. But that's the way we run the Section 8 program. It's not an entitlement. There are long waiting lists for the limited amount of vouchers that are authorized. So that's one reform that we could do on a national basis. But there are some communities in this country and some states in this country that actually prohibit what is called source of income discrimination. Prohibit landlords from refusing to accept a tenant because they have a Section 8 voucher. That would be a policy that could be enacted both in, in at a county level and at a state level. Uh, another thing we could do is, well, I, I already mentioned, we need to reform our, our exclusionary zoning laws in the suburbs uh, to permit apartments to be built so that we can integrate the suburbs with uh, moderate, low-income, and middle-class families. So there are many reforms that we could enact, and as I said before, they don't cost any money. Uh, they just cost political will. Thank you. And if anybody hasn't read the book, it's fabulous. You should read it. I appreciate hearing all the truth that's been spoken today. My name's Deborah Crawford. I've been going to a lot of city council meetings in the last two years, and I've been learning a lot about city politics. And while I'm very thankful that you're bringing out these facts related to past policies, I think we all have to be very careful about what's happening in Columbus and across the country right now. So I'd like um, Dr. Rothstein to talk about, you talked a lot about the suburbs. Well, it's almost flipping now, and white people want to live in the city now. And the gentrification that's flying through the city of Columbus is really changing things, and I don't think it's for the better. And if we don't pay attention, we're going to be creating the same policies that we're talking about now, and 30 years from now, somebody can write a book about, which is not what we want. So will you please talk about the wildfire gentrification that's going on in Columbus, sometimes unchecked, in the name of development. Thank you. Well, it's always easier to focus on things that are changing rather than things that remain the same. But it remains the case that the vast majority of white middle class families still live in all white middle class communities. A gentrification is going on, but it's a small proportion of the white population that's engaged in it. Now, we do need to follow policies to uh, prevent the worst outcomes from gentrification. And somebody mentioned before inclusionary zoning. We need to preserve a share of housing in, in gentrifying neighborhoods for low and middle income families, uh, f families who used to live there and, and still live there and preserve their right to remain. But you know, gentrification, every neighborhood should be gentrified. Gentrified. Every community should be gentrified. Every community should have a mix of affluent, middle class, moderate, and low income housing. And if you have gentrification, even if you succeed in preserving a certain share of that housing in that community for people who used to live there, the vast majority of people are going to be displaced. So the solution to gentrification is not only has to take place in the gentrifying neighborhoods, but in the suburbs from which the people who are displaced are now excluded. So you need a combination of uh, inclusionary zoning, not only in the gentrifying neighborhoods, but also in the suburbs to which people will inevitably be displaced. The next question. My name is Anthony Neely. I'm a ghost writer. I write to help other people tell their stories in the books that I write. And I just finished a book by, um, about a man named Ermin K. Jones, who was the uh, president of the NAACP in a city, a small town called Asbury Park, New Jersey, near New York City. Uh, he successfully sued a developer, like the developer of Levittown, in, 196, in the early 1960s. He got the uh, uh, New Jersey Supreme Court to rule in his favor and, and uh, contributed to uh, 
the downgrading or the, the diminishing, diminishing of discrimination in New Jersey uh, by winning that lawsuit. Uh, so I'm really fascinated by uh, Mr. Rothstein's work. My question is, uh, uh, also being fascinated by the story you told about Senator Taft uh, and the poison pill that he used to uh, codify discrimination, is there something that uh, a liberal Democrat could do today politically uh, to reverse uh, the discrimination that's, uh, 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 that the government has uh, created? Uh, a creative poison pill type strategy. <laughs> Any ideas? Well. No, we're going to need a, uh, an effective political majority in this country that understands the de jure nature of the segregation that we experience and is willing to undertake the kinds of reforms necessary to remedy it. Uh, I don't think that the liberal Democrats uh, are the solution. Everybody needs to be uh, involved. Clearly, we're not going to get 100 percent, but we need a different political majority. And um, I'm hopeful that if people begin to talk about this history and, and um, in their communities and in their churches and in their schools that we begin to develop a different consensus that will um, enable us to enact remedial policies. Right now we don't have a political majority that will do it. Can I um, speak yes, to no, that Seema, also? Yeah. Um, I think small bites sometimes are just as effective when you can't necessarily eat the whole thing at one time. Uh, for example, I don't know if you're familiar with the Garrett versus Hamtramck case where um, minorities were displaced for the building of Chrysler Free Freeway in the city of Detroit. That case was back in 1971. It did not resolve until 2015. Part of, and, and the judge who was on that case was Damon Keith, who I clerked for, and part of the remedy that was um, ordered was for the building of family units and the building of senior citizen units to provide a relief to those families that were displaced. And so, yes, in 2015, the folks who lived there and who were removed back then were no longer there, but it went to their heirs. It went to their family members. But they were required to rebuild and market rate homes for those families that were illegally displaced. The other thing that I would say that's important to try to, you know, help attack this problem is we need to follow the law. We are a nation of laws, but if we don't, uh, we don't apply them and follow them and apply them equally to everyone, it's of no consequence. It does not work. And so I think that's a critical piece to it as well, making sure that if you're in a position to implement laws, to carry out the Constitution, and it is the supreme law of the land, then you should do that. And I think that's part and parcel of it. We have, yes, yes. Yes. We have two more questions, and then we'll wrap it up. I'll try to make it quick. Uh, thank you for the, the segue, um, that last comment, into this question. Uh, my name is Marcus Roth, and I'm with the Coalition on Homelessness and Housing in Ohio. Uh, we pay close attention to what's going on at HUD, and we've noticed kind of a pattern over the last year and a half of sort of, I guess, de-emphasizing the importance of Fair Housing, Fair Housing Act. Um, and just this morning, we saw a headline coming out about how uh, there's a new mission statement at HUD that removes any reference to um, inclusive communities free from discrimination. So the question uh, really is, what do you think might be the long-term impact of this kind of backing away from the Federal Fair Housing Act and enforcing it? Are we going to the bad old days, in other words? Well, I actually don't think it um, has much consequence because we weren't about to do anything about this anyway. You know, we have a lot of nice language, so they're changing the language, ratifying the fact that we're not doing anything about it. But as I, uh, I, I don't want to keep on repeating myself, but we need a new effective consensus. Doesn't mean everybody, but an effective political consensus that can begin to implement the kinds of policies that I've been describing. It's not as though we were implementing them before and now HUD is stopping implementing them. They're just stopping talking about them. That's too bad, but um, that's not really what the problem is. The problem is the underlying policies that we've never addressed, and uh, not just in this administration, but in previous administrations. And the final question. Let me, let me say something. Oh, yes. Um, 
She, she mentioned, we, we got to get back to what she said. She talked about gentrification. I think the suburbanization of poverty is, is something that we've all experienced. And if you're someone who's in education or dealt with it, I've worked with Westerville City Schools, Hilliard City Schools, Whitehall Schools. I've worked with all these schools. And the suburbanization of poverty is a real phenomenon because poor communities are being pushed out to the suburbs and they're you know, dealing with this, some of the same issues in the inner city. I, walk, I work with teachers all the time and they say, well, we don't really understand how to, to deal with a lot of these kids. So we can't just push out without actually coming up with some type of solution to actually help these families, mm -hmm. these kids, because they're in a different environment. So all they're doing is basically bringing a lot of the, the poverty uh, mindset with them to the suburbs. And that's something that we, we really have to address. And, you know, that's the issue that's being skated here. And now. Uh, yes, I'm Jillian Olinger. I'm with Kerwin Institute at Ohio State University. And today we've talked a lot about history, systems, structures, and policies that have stratified. But research that we're doing at the Institute really explores how these, this historic stratification, how we internalize that and how that manifests as our implicit bias and as our association between race and risk. And so I just wondered if any of the panelists could kind of speak to that issue, any personal experiences, any um, suggestions on kind of unwinding these associations. Well, I think that's critical, addressing the whole issue of subconscious bias, because at the end of the day, these, are, these policies and practices have been in play for a long time. So they have had generations to fester and, and, and ferment in you know, folks' lives and their thinking and, passed, and then it's passed on from generation to generation. And I'm speaking not just about in white communities in terms of how they think about themselves necessarily if you know, I have and, and I'm better than. I'm speaking also about blacks. I, I don't have, I'm less than, how that whole line of thinking is passed down from generation to generation. I think how it starts, how we start to deal with it is exactly what we're doing right now, is having this conversation, but we gotta keep having a conversation. We gotta take the conversation elsewhere as well, because just like I was trained a certain way, my children are being trained a certain way, and we have to be the ones who take ownership of changing it to a different school of thought. Lawrence, did you have something to add? I, I do. I, I think just because we've been emancipated doesn't mean we're free. And I think um, this is a huge issue when it comes to wealth. Uh, you're talking about wealth and risk. There, there, there are distinct differences, which I point out in my book, about uh, how classes, my book is more about class than about race, but in terms of how racial groups invest, how they spend their money, how they invest their time, and those types of things, I mean, these things are real. And, and when you think about slavery has is still impacting in us to this day in terms of being slave because we've been kept out. You, you know, housing is just symptomatic of a much deeper uh, issue that we need to address, and I think it has to be a holistic remedy. And obviously, talking about this in 30 minutes, 45 minutes, it's not going to solve everything. But I think I'm very appreciative, everyone who stayed. You've taken the time to listen. And my challenge to you, as I said before, you've got to do more. If you want to be a change agent, it has to start with you. You can't pass the buck to anybody else. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed today's forum. I know I did. We encourage you to continue the conversation outside because the room's full, which is a good thing, uh, with coffee and cookies. You can view and share today's forum and all of our forums on CTV, Columbus Television, on WOSU and PBS affiliates statewide through the Ohio Channel, and anytime on CMC's website via YouTube. Let's thank our sponsors, United Way of Central Ohio Dispatch Media Group, And our, and our partners, the Ohio Civil Rights Commission. And of course, our speakers, Richard Rothstein, Lawrence Funderburk, Nasiba Southern, and Tim Farron.